Long, uh, Director of Special Ed Procedure. Uh, we will be starting, uh, my clock says one o'clock. So uh, as you may have seen, please remember to mute your microphone. Um, uh, we want to try to have as good of an audio as we can because this session will be uh, recorded for uh, posting later on Blackboard. So we have just about 55 minutes for this session. Um, so we appreciate if we uh, can have some of the questions held till a couple places or one place in the middle. We're going to pause, take a few questions, and then we'll take as many as we can toward the end. Uh, and then I have staff who will be making note of any questions that uh, folks post in the chat box, and we'll add those. We'll address them as we can, and we'll add them to our frequently asked questions. So uh, for our time today, about half the time, we're going to be focusing on some procedural topics. And the content is modified from what was provided to department chairs and leads last week. Um, we're not giving principals absolutely all the detail that we gave to them, but we're giving you the highlights and the topics that we know are on your minds about special education from the procedural side of things. And then colleagues in DSS in the instruction and uh, intervention sections will discuss instruction topics and staff expectations. Um, so um, again, midway, we'll try to do a quick pause and take a few questions. Um, we are planning to do a version of this with even more detail on the temporary learning plans with our teachers. We're going to record that and post it uh, for Monday so that teachers understand um, the directions for the temporary learning plans. So with that, um, there are some myths out there. You may have received some thoughts and questions from staff and or parents already. Uh, we are not amending all student IEPs and 504 plans. Instead, we are creating something that we call the temporary learning plan, uh, and it will be developed for each student with a disability. We will have uh, annual IEP meetings that are held. So we will try our best to um, help you and teachers meet annual timelines for IEPs. And those will be done uh, with virtual platforms that we'll get to a little bit later on in the presentation. There also may be IEP meetings that do need to be held uh, due to certain cir circumstances, special needs, and so um, OSEPs and instruction staff will assist schools when those needs arise. So what is a temporary learning plan? Uh, you're going to see one in a few minutes, but um, case managers will be given guiding questions by due process and eligibility uh, for calling parents. Now, hopefully, parents have already been um, contacted by case managers and teachers. That was something that was an expectation already, but for for specifically for the temporary learning plan, um, the process starts with a phone call to get input from parents. That conversation is documented by the case manager. Uh, we will get instructions for how to do that using both a contact log in CSTARS uh, and to upload documents in CSTARS where we'll be able to uh, keep all of that important documentation. The letter gets sent home. The temporary learning plan is a letter format you will see in a moment. And it gets sent home uh, to parents in a PDF and is uploaded so that we all have that um, for um, keeping records. So uh, I think if Dawn Schaefer is on, I think she might have left and come back, but she's going to take you through the, uh, the format of the TLP. Thanks, Dawn. Go ahead. All right, so hi everybody. Um, so my team's been working hard at getting this TLP up and running for folks and for our teachers to use. And as you can see on your screen, it is in a letter format. It should look familiar, um, much like many of the other special education letters that we use. Um, what we're asking <clears throat> staff to do in the middle of the page, um, is to um, 
select goals or objectives, accommodations and services from the current IEP as our starting point um, and think about, um, you know, what kind of things could they work on realistically during this time that we have distance learning in place and what accommodations <clears throat> might be needed. Um, and then <clears throat> uh, choose any appropriate services um, that would be in place uh, during this time. Um, and we'll look at that in just a second. There's also a spot for consent, which you'll see in just a moment. It's not on this, it's not visible on this um, screen. Um, so this is the first half of the document, a little bit bigger um, for you for you to be able to see. And if you'll notice, it does ask teachers to make a phone call, um, as Jane mentioned before. And there's language there that says, you know, we're identifying those services and consultation that will be provided for your child between now and the end of the school year. Um, and so we're asking uh, case managers to collaborate with other service providers for students to figure out what's appropriate and what makes sense as they choose goals, objectives, accommodations, and services for students. And those would be from the most recent IEP. This is the second half of the document, <clears throat> and it's asking parents to, um, it's saying, you know, your current IEP will go back into effect when school goes back into session. And if you want to talk about it, we can talk about it. And if you would like, we could also hold an IEP meeting. And this goes back to what Jane had mentioned earlier about, <clears throat> excuse me, about the possibility of IEP meetings based on this. Um, it is asking parents if they agree to let the case manager know. Um, <clears throat> some parents will prefer to sign the document and return it, and they can do that via email as well. Um, there's also a reference to the procedural safeguards. We're asking the case manager to sign the document and provide some contact information. Um, and this is the plan that we're asking folks to do. All right. Jane, did you want me to keep talking or did you want to jump in? I think you can do this one. Thanks. <laughs> sure. Um, <clears throat> so we... Um, we met with our PSLs um, last week to, to kind of start talking about this. Um, and one thing that we sort of organically came up with was a conceptualization of how, um, how IEP meetings and how special ed processes are, are happening during this time. Um, and we're looking at all students receiving this temporary learning plan. Um, some students may need <clears throat> something specific um, addressed through an addendum without a meeting. Um, fewer students were looking at needing IEP meetings, 504 plan meetings, local screening eligibility, reevaluations, <clears throat> 504 qualifications or transfer um, documents. Um, and a note about transfer documents, we um, we do ask that if you have any transfers, and I've, I've heard of a, a handful across the county so far, um, that you contact uh, my team, uh, the specialist who supports your school, uh, because we need to work with you a little bit, um, because there's a couple of things we need to do during this time. And then <clears throat> in the red part of this triangle, we're looking at uh, using this platform for IEP meetings. So <clears throat> for 504 meetings and, and special ed meetings, um, so we still need local screening to happen. Um, we want to encourage you all to collaborate and develop schedules similar to what you're doing during the regular school year. Um, we're still obligated to accept referrals and then to make a determination at local screening as to whether an evaluation is needed to be conducted when school resumes. And we have um, developed another letter called the <clears throat> Extension of Timelines for Eligibility Letter that we'll be sharing with you in just a moment. Um, Reevaluations still need to occur. Um, we need to figure out, you know, much like we do during the school year, do we need to do um, 
testing for those and hopefully your teams have thought through that <clears throat> prior to now so they know which cases um, that would be needed for and we'll look at that letter in just a bit so one change um, that we'll be looking at is we're allowing folks to draft um, the entire IEP and provide it to the parent ahead of the meeting um, one thing that um, is going to be important is allowing folks to follow along uh, during the meeting if we're on a teleconference um, it's a little bit easier to do so if you have what people are talking from in front of you so they are allowed to draft as much of the IEP as they would like to prior to the meeting or that they feel comfortable with um, and provide that to the parent <clears throat> we are still doing addendums and as I said before, if you have any transfers, um, and we're hoping there aren't many with um, Governor Northam's stay put order, um, so <clears throat> if you have those, please contact your DPE specialist. Um, and your uh, lead teachers and department chairs, they're aware of that as well. Um, we're also still obligated to do any Section 504 qualifications that occur as well. Consent <clears throat> is looking just a little bit different um, during this time, um, considering we're not using paper. Um, so we're asking <clears throat> teams to present the parent with the proposal. The parent could provide verbal consent, which the, the school team would document on the PWN that they provide to the parent. Um, <clears throat> they can also ask the parent to send an email providing consent when they're ready. Um, they could also, as, as I said before, um, choose to provide consent through their signature um, or other electronic means. Um, and then it's so, so, so important. We're asking folks to use CSTARS to document um, all of their contacts with families as well as um, any, <clears throat> any documents or signatures um, or proposals that have been made so that we can keep track of those since we don't have paper files to follow at the moment. Okay, um, is this still me or is this someone else at this point? <laughs> Thanks, Dawn. <laughs> I got sure. you. So, um, as you see here on the slide, um, and, and most principals are aware that um, their, each school was given a temporary conference line telephone line. We have been asked repeatedly, could schools have more? And unfortunately, we don't have more to give. Um, also, we were asked that the conference line, you know, there is a cost to the division. So please use those judiciously. Um, you may want to, at your school, come, come up with your process for who reserves your conference line for when. Um, so the meeting formats, though, that you have at your disposal include, like this, Blackboard Collaborate. And we communicated with leads and chairs that we prefer Blackboard Collaborate for its security and the ability to share C-STARS if you're doing an annual IEP. Uh, like Dawn said, um, you can send the PDF of a draft home ahead of time to also assist families. Um, especially when using the teleconference format. Google Meet in the asterisk there, um, we are not necessarily recommending that you use that for all of your meetings. We know that it'll be used quite a bit for other purposes. Um, but as you see in the asterisk, Google Meet is the platform for any meeting having to do with needing closed captioning or uh, translation for deaf or hard of hearing students and families. Zoom is not approved. We get that question quite a lot because apparently other places have used it. Um, IT has not approved us to do um, Zoom. We will be looking with IT at any other options because I think people are worried about the log jam of the few opportunities you do have. Uh, but again, I can't emphasize enough, I think people were worried that they were having to amend every IEP in your building and you don't have to do that. All right, so, um, you know, in sum, um, there will be IEP meetings. You will use the different platforms uh, and opportunities for those meetings. 
for specific needs, annuals, or addendums if there is something special that is needed. Um, leads and chairs in their training received a lot of step-by-step -step direction on the best way, you know, the norms, and the best method to use Blackboard especially uh, as the preferred option for an IEP meeting. So the Virginia Department of Education in their frequently asked questions uh, did suggest that there are already regulation flexibility in the Virginia regulations. So here in Fairfax, we um, have had a procedure in place for extending timelines, um, but there had been some limits that we had placed on it. For the purpose of this shutdown for COVID-19, you know, there's more flexibility allowed. So parents and school division together can um, extend the timeline, the 65 business day timeline in writing, uh, so that evaluations uh, for face-to-face -face evaluations of students would occur once schools reopen and uh, the process can be completed. So Dawn is going to show us now the um, the letter that has been developed for this purpose. Thanks, Jane. Um, this letter, as you can see, looks very similar to all of the other um, sort of DSS letters that we use. Um, but it does say, <clears throat> you know, essentially due to the shutdown, um, we're closed uh, and social distancing and self-quarantining are recommended. Um, and <clears throat> that there are no in-person testing um, or evaluations happening right now. And so um, that 65 business day timeline will resume once schools are reopened. Um, and we're looking at um, if parents agree to this, that the, <clears throat> the eligibility committee would come back within 45 school days of uh, schools reopening. In the middle, it's asking for parents to either reply via email um, and confirm their agreement with the extension of the timeline, um, or they could sign and return it, much like we saw on the uh, temporary learning plan, and <clears throat> also providing um, contact information for uh, the individual sending the letter. I do want to say before we take a few questions, um, if parents do not agree to extend the timeline, we are asking those eligibility committees to go ahead and meet um, and use the information that they currently have. So they would possibly not have, um, they, they would possibly not find the student eligible because they don't have data um, to support that. And that's one, um, that's one uh, thing that a lot of, uh, department chairs and lead teachers had questions about last week. So we're um, seeing some questions come in um, in the chat uh, window, and I see Andrew is answering um, some of those questions as we go. Uh, Debbie? So I have a couple of the questions. You want me to call them out, and then Jane and you can, um, um, other than the ones that Andrew just um, um, answered. So it said, what happens if parents don't consent to the TLP? Right. So um, thank you for that question. So there's not a set procedure other than your teachers and you would want to communicate with the PSL and um, or if, if uh, you need to DPE or one of us in the OSEP's office. And we'll take, like we do during the school year, we will do whatever dispute resolution process seems uh, the most efficient at that time. We expect there will be some parents who don't consent, um, you know, but this is an extraordinary circumstance, and so we will have to take those case by case. Okay, so another question is, when should teachers start um, writing the temporary learning plans April 13th? And there was also about the same thing about the um, evaluation dawn. When should those, when should we start sending those out? Should we wait I till think, the 13th? Oh, good. I, I was wondering if my mic was off. Um, sorry about that. Um, I think 
when they come back from spring break, they can start doing these processes. Um, the, there are questions about um, where to find these letters. Um, right. they're, sitting, they're sitting with IT uh, in, in their documents management office right now. Um, I asked them to have these completed as soon as possible. Um, <clears throat> and so we're hoping to be able to get those out in time for teachers to return next week. I think we'll be able to do that. Um, they'll be able to be found um, for right now. They'll be in what we're calling a procedural toolkit that'll be on the due process and eligibility intranet page um, where they can find both letters and uh, some steps to step to step, step by step directions um, for, you know, um, conducting virtual meetings and um, a lot of the things that we're, we're working through procedurally right now. So there are a couple of questions about an interpreter. Can parents provide verbal consent via an interpreter? And Marie Lemon had a question. She uses a bilingual clerical person to schedule meetings. Should the teacher take her log and enter it into CSTARS? I would say yes to both questions. Um, so yeah, this is Jane real quick. I'm seeing that um, some of the um, audio might have cut out. So Due Process and Eligibility uh, has created a toolkit that will be placed on the intranet uh, site so that these documents and guidance uh, documents are available to your teachers. We're also, at the, as I said at the beginning, we're going to be recording a Collaborate and posting for teachers on the step-by-step -step of the TLP, the Temporary Learning Plan, and the 65-day extension letter. So you're getting the high view right now, and then we're going to get in the weeds with a uh, uh, session for teachers. Thanks. Go ahead, Debbie. Okay, I think Andrew already um, answered Jay's about mailing. Jay had a question. Um, Jay Pearson had a question about um, about mailing the items out. Um, is anything being mailed? If so, how are, how are we dealing with postage? Uh, I'm going to weigh in here. I am working with Marty Smith to figure out a way that we can access mail and what that's going to look like. So uh, right now, my conversation with Marty has been around how to mail materials from schools or things that have been copied for parents that might need packets and hard copies. And I'll add the document question as well during our conversations. Thank you. Um, Jane, you have, a, you have time for another one? I think we have just time for a couple more and then we want to move on. But um, I will say um, to Elizabeth about the timeline, we have not set a due date for the TLP. Um, but, you know, I want to reemphasize, I think I said this earlier, but hopefully teachers have already reached out to the parents. Um, but then the beginning of the procedure for the TLP is another reach out because we want their input. We know that we will have a variety of um, expectations from parents. And so we want to get their input and then the teachers work on the TLP and then send it out. So they do need several days, of course, for that process to happen. Uh, but yeah, so we, we have not set an absolute due date for you all at your buildings please um, you know, have that be a priority for your teachers. Okay, and there was one about, for parents without email addresses, we were going to get verbal permission to send to the child's, G, the child's Gmail account. Is that okay? Yes. You can, so the teacher can ask the, the parent during a phone call, um, are you okay with us emailing documents? We use email a lot, quite a bit right now. Um, and so they should continue with that and double check with the parent if it's okay. All right, so um, with that, we, we should have time at the end. We're, we're running pretty good on time. Let's hold any more questions and move on. I believe, I, sorry, I believe next um, I'm going to turn this over to Mike. Or no, um, Ellie. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Hi everyone, this is Ellie. So great to have you all here today. Just want to take, take a quick second to let you know where there are a lot of resources for you and your teachers. The Office of Special Ed Instruction is using Blackboard 24-7 as the main conduit of the resources that we are providing for your teachers. And so when you go in Blackboard 24-7,
Many of you all have already seen this, but if you haven't, there's a folder with distance learning support, and you click on the distance learning resources link. That is where you will find all of the information from us as well as from instructional services. It is chock full of information. This is where you can find copies of the packets so that teachers have the packets in front of them, whether they are the, uh, the ISD grade level packets or the special education packets. You find those on, in that folder. And then below the distance learning packet folder, you can also find a special education folder. And like I said, that is where we are putting resources. We have resources for instruction, behavior, executive functioning, paraprofessional use, um, you name it, we've got resources there for you. That's also where we are listing our office hours. We do have office hours set up for Monday the 13th, and then until the end of the year, we have office hours uh, twice a week uh, from two to four for different programs, and then we are setting up additional office hours as needed. This is also where you can find the trainings that were put out last week by the Office of Special Ed Instruction and the Office of Special Ed Procedural Support. There is a recording to all of the trainings that were done last week and as appropriate or needed, a link to the handouts. So this is where you and your teams can find the trainings. There have been a lot of questions about how are we using or can we use research-based programs uh, during this time period of distance learning. And one of the things that is so interesting about this distance learning uh, scenario that we're in is so many of the answers that we were so absolute on just a month ago or two months ago when we were face-to-face, -face, we're giving very different direction now. And I've had to work with my team on that, but also as we've met with teachers to let them know that, yes, this is the total opposite of what we said just two months ago. So as you all know, this the education that we're providing in the instruction during the distancing phase is not going to replicate what we provide when we are providing face-to-face -face instruction. So when it comes to using research-based programs, we have had to work with different companies to find out their copyright permissions to let us use different aspects of their programs during distance learning. Depending on the program and depending on the company, they have provided us different levels of access to what we can use during this distance learning phase. There is training that we just posted Monday. Was that just yesterday? We just posted it yesterday that provides an overview of how research-based programs might be used during this phase. We do not expect any of the programs to be used the exact same way that we do when students are in school face-to-face. -face. We do not expect the same fidelity to the time of the program or even using the entire program itself. And each program has different permissions that have been provided to us from the company. And so we are putting that information on FCPS 24-7. In some cases, for some programs, we cannot use any part of their program during distance learning. For other programs or companies, we can use different aspects. And so we are encouraging teachers to use the aspect that they're able to use as it works for them and their students. There are so many different um, things that we need to take into account right now, and we are not putting the guidance out there that it must look the same for every teacher and for every student. We're here to help your teachers find a way to use aspects of programs, um, and so we can help them with that. There are a few cases where we might switch from using one program from face-to-face -face instruction and where one company has said, no, we cannot use their program during distance learning. We have another company that has said, yes, you can use this with whoever you want. And so we might be switching some students to a different program during this distance learning phase, still working on the same skill areas with the understanding that when we do come back to school, we're going to be having a conversation that we typically have at the beginning of every school year 
we look at the student, we look at their where their areas of needs are, and we talk as a team about what program is going to be the best for the student moving forward. So even if a student does use a different program during this or a different aspect of a program, I just want to keep being clear, we're not using the whole program, but different parts or aspects of a program. If we do switch programs during this time and we feel that's what's most appropriate for the student, we will still have that conversation that we have every year about what the best way to move forward. But that information is in our 24-7 folder and it is being updated right now on a daily basis. A couple weeks ago, you could imagine it was being updated on an hour to hour basis, but now we're at least at daily updates. There have been many questions about the packets that are going home. And you can see on this slide, students are receiving the early childhood packets or the adapted curriculum packet. For the adapted curriculum packet, we had to choose a data point that could help us decide who's going to receive a packet and who will not receive the packet. So you could see for students in grades K through two, we used the primary case manager report in CSTARS and we determined who was in the ID, IDS, or enhanced autism program. We know that there are some students at your school who are being educated on an adapted curriculum and they may not have received the initial packet. And that's okay. You or somebody at your school just need to email me name, ID number, and grade level. We also know that there are some students who might be, as an example, enrolled in an enhanced autism in, in grade two, but that student is being instructed on the general curriculum. Your school team can also email me that student's name, and I will take them off of the adapted curriculum list and I will put them on the uh, ISD grade level packets. So while we have put together our information, it can still be changed as we move forward. For the early childhood and the adapted curriculum, those packets will be going home weekly. We did have an opportunity to send home a special education general curriculum to every other student with an IEP or a 504 plan. This packet was from week one, and due to the delays in printing, you know, with the governor's different announcements, some of those packets are just now arriving in students' homes. So if you have a student who is not receiving the adapted curriculum or the or early childhood uh, packet, they, are re they received or were on the list to receive the special education general curriculum packet. The special education general curriculum packet was sent to all students in grades K through uh, six, like I said, who did not receive another packet. We are sending out one more special education general curriculum packet, and that should be arriving at home the week of April 20th uh, for our students. And those packets include general strategies to support students with disabilities during this time. We do have special educators uh, who work at central office who are providing input in the creation of the grade level packets with instructional services. So do know that as they create the general education grade level packets, there is input from both special education as well as from our ESOL counterparts. And I already mentioned, if you have students that you want to add or remove from the packets, you can contact Denise Forrest for, for preschool and then uh, myself, Ellie Stack, at for anybody else. And that is the end of my time. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Mike Bloom. Thank you, Ellie, for sharing that information. And I wanted to talk with you a little bit about some of our staff roles. Uh, in the chat box, I did see some questions regarding our CAPI students and students with significant challenges uh, accessing the adapted curriculum. I think that there are decisions that need to be made between our teachers, case managers, and our parents around the feasibility of which goals might be part of that temporary learning plan. I think that some students will have a parent or guardian that's able to assist at home and through communication with either related service providers or with the case manager, 
they'll be able to work through some of the instructional pieces regarding the synchronous and asynchronous learning uh, that might take place. But for other parents, they might not be available. Uh, there might be uh, considerations or concerns regarding internet access and having access to only the packets. So I think a lot of those individual decisions will take place between the related service providers, collaborating with your case managers, your teachers, and alongside the parent so that the best decisions can be made moving forward. So I just wanted to, to mention that. Um, the current slide talks a little bit about some staff roles. Of course, we've included your special education case managers and teachers with some of the roles that uh, they're expected to fulfill through a distance learning platform. Um, Ellie had mentioned that we've also uh, put together a document that we're going to be posting for paraprofessionals. It's really meant for your teachers and your paras to look through and talk about together in terms of how that para might be able to be utilized through a distance learning format. So we're going to be posting that information uh, in the Blackboard Collaborate site. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the Blackboard site with the teacher resources, as well as our PD uh, webpage. And we've also got in the next slide some information more specific to our related service providers that we wanted to talk about. So the slide as it's appearing on your screen does not contain, it's probably a technical glitch, but it doesn't contain all of the information um, to the right of that arrow that talks about coaching and collaboration. So I'm going to at least point out the different tiers along the continuum of support provided by our related and additional service providers. So on the very bottom, what you're not seeing is information related to teacher and team supports. So we expect that all of our related service and additional service providers will be available to your school teams to problem solve. There are going to be lots of new challenges related to uh, the provision of related services, uh, related to assistive technology, some of the different supports that students might be receiving in the school environment that again may or may not be feasible in a home environment. So we want to make sure that all of our related service providers are available to your teachers, available to you to be able to problem solve and, and collaborate on that first level. Moving up one from the bottom, task and environmental accommodations and modifications. So we want to make sure that our related service providers are available to collaborate with your teachers and your case managers um, regarding certain modifications or an environmental uh, modifications that might need to be made. They'll also be available to have conversations with parents around the home environment and what learning might look like uh, if a student receives certain accommodations to support uh, their writing process or to support um, some of the uh, speech and language activities that they're being provided uh, in the classroom. We want to make sure that related service providers are having those same conversations with parents and with teachers around what those accommodations or modifications might look like in a home environment. As we move up one more on our tier, the next one should say targeted support of the family and student. So there is an expectation that our related service providers are going to be communicating directly with parents and with students and they'll be talking specifically about how that student is able to navigate and function within a virtual environment. They're going to be collaborating, brainstorming, giving ideas to parents and to students around how they might be able to better access that home learning environment. So we do expect that there will be some targeted support uh, to our families and to our students. And at the, at the very top, this is what we call simultaneous support or our synchronous support. So we do know that many of our related service providers will be joining general education colleagues in some of the lessons, some of the synchronous lessons that they're going to be providing online. So they'll be in there with students and with general ed teachers and or special ed teachers. They'll be observing uh, they'll be following up afterward with individual sessions 
with parents and with students to talk about for example, if they were targeting certain goals related to communication or social skills, then there might be an opportunity in an individual session with a parent or student to talk through some of those goals and some of those things that they observed as they were in that larger classroom. There will also be opportunities for some potential small group instruction as well as individual instruction. But again, we want to stress the point that there is an expectation that our related service providers will be providing both synchronous and asynchronous support uh, with parents and with students in the virtual environment. The slide that school psychologists and social workers. So if we look at the next slide, I'm going to turn things over to Donna in Intervention and Prevention Services, and she's going to talk a little bit more about the role of psychologists and school social workers. Thanks, Mike. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to share information this afternoon with regard to how school psychologists and school social workers are supporting not only the special education process, but larger services to students at your school as well. Um, as Mike mentioned, um, related service providers, that includes school psychologists and social workers, will be supporting all of those tiers that Mike shared um, just a moment ago. Um, school psychologists and social workers are available to participate in those meetings, local screening meetings, um, eligibility meetings, et cetera, that we've been talking about earlier in the presentation. I do want to um, make a point here that it will be critically important for those students who have counseling as a related service on their IEP that the psychologist or social worker is brought into the discussion about the focus of that temporary learning plan and what goals and objectives will be continue to be included in that plan um, so we can determine how to best support those goals um, through service provision and or consultation with either teachers or parents. Um, school psychologists and social workers are always available to collaborate with teachers with regard to how to incorporate social and emotional learning into both the synchronous and asynchronous lessons that they'll be providing. Um, they'll be providing consultation to special education teachers, um, again, regarding whether or not um, students will continue to or need and receive uh, direct services or whether those services will be consultative in nature, certainly um, in response to any mental health concerns that teachers might um, have for uh, students. Uh, they can reach out to um, psychologists and social workers for support in that way as well. Um, we also will be providing support for school staff and parents related to behaviors that might be showing up either in the home environment or even during the synchronous uh, learning opportunities that might be interfering with the student's ability to one participate and to benefit from those opportunities so um, please engage us in in those opportunities as well um, as uh, folks have already discussed our staff have already been uh, reaching out to students and families particularly those on their caseload and also students and families um, for whom teachers or other school staff have expressed concerns most of you know that we are offering student and parent clinic consultative services. Um, we are um, uh, providing that currently during spring break with our 12-month staff, and then that will be a district-wide um, approach to supporting students and families um, moving forward in the work. Um, that actually was just released again today in the news releases, so hopefully um, you'll be sharing that with your broader school communities as well as you share information with them. Um, we certainly will continue to work with students and families um, in terms of maintaining those connections that they have to private service providers and making referrals to community resources as needed. Um, we are working very closely with our county partners um, and have uh, current information about what resources are available to them and connect, can connect families and students to those resources as well. Um, as was mentioned earlier, face-to-face in-person assessments will um, resume once students are back in school and available. Um, however, I do um, want to share that sociocultural assessments will likely take place um, during this um, distance learning as they can be done, uh, completed via phone. Um, lastly, um, just want to share that school counselors are also available and will be engaged in the 504 process in a very similar way um, that they have been engaged um, in, the, in, in uh, real time and live uh, service provision. 
Um, I do want to add just one um, minor uh, comment. Um, I know that a lot of the um, other service providers are posting office hours, um, and I do want to share that um, school psychologists and workers are available and working, um, so they should be uh, available all the time to you um, unless they're involved in a meeting. Um, reach out to them by email or phone. Um, are not setting specific office hours um, and remain available to you um, to provide support. Thank you, Donna. I just wanted to go over a couple of other quick things in the interest of time. So there are some additional expectations from our related service providers uh, that we've listed here. I won't go into each one, but just know that uh, we do have expectations that our related service providers are going to be available to you and your staff around some of these collaborations and some of these meetings where you're asking them to participate and to work with families around supports and services. We're also asking our related service providers to maintain a daily schedule that's really commensurate with teacher level staff. So they're going to be holding office hours, planning time, uh, and again interacting with students and families similar to, similar to what your teachers will be doing. And then lastly, we talked a little bit about office hours and on our PD website, which I provided the link earlier in the chat box, there's going to be a listing of all the different office hours that are going to be provided. We're going to have specific office hours for our ABA and Enhanced Autism and PAC uh, classrooms, our adapted curriculum, our general curriculum, accommodations, support will be a separate office hours, behavior intervention, early childhood, so those will all have separate opportunities for your staff to call in, to brainstorm, to ask specific questions. Assistive technology services. Again, here's a continuum of SIS that our ATS resource teachers will be providing. A lot of these same supports they provide to your teachers throughout the school year, but now they'll be providing through a virtual environment. So we're going to be providing supports to you and your teachers as needed. We're going to be asking them to support conversations around the home environment and specific modifications or accommodations that might be needed in the home environment. And then we're also asking that as appropriate, they would reach out and have individual conferences and meetings with family members to again brainstorm around the use of assistive technology within the home environment. And then my last slide, I wanted to again emphasize that the role of our ABA coaches and our behavior intervention teachers will be very similar to their support throughout the school year. So our ABA coaches will be touching base with their assigned teachers. They'll be assisting with the development of lessons, breaking down skills. They'll be assisting with PAC, Enhanced Autism, and CAP-E teachers, uh, collaborating with your teachers upon request. Uh, and the expectation is that they'll also be connecting on a weekly basis with their assigned teachers and classrooms. Our bits, the same thing. They'll be providing behavioral support uh, individually to uh, schools that they support during the school year. Uh, teachers can access them at any time through email if they're having specific questions regarding behavior support in the distance learning environment. They can also work with you to provide any level of online professional development if you feel it's needed for your teachers. And they'll also be available uh, during IEP meetings to support as appropriate. Okay, thank you. So um, our due process and eligibility uh, office and OSEPs will have more um, Blackboard office hours. We had uh, two so far and um, not a lot of traffic by um, special ed leads and chairs, but some. And then you always have available to you the DPE uh, email for sending in questions that gets monitored and answered contact your PSL or any of the leadership about uh, procedure, um, OSEI, uh, Mike's team for instruction. The DSS intranet page um, has all of the presentations, all of the resources, and schedule of office hours. Um, you know, some of the um, concluding thoughts, and then we'll take a few questions in the five minutes we have left. This is uncharted territory. We don't have every answer that we all want, right? So we are working very hard to um, thoughtfully answer the questions so that 
we don't have a lot of confusion out there, but thank you for bearing with us. Distance learning and temporary learning plans are not meant to recreate school or IEPs, and that will probably be what some parents think and expect. So we do know there will be a need. Uh, some of the chat questions were, what do we do if you know parents don't consent and so on? Those are those special circumstances I talked in the beginning about where we may need to schedule IEP meetings. So we will just make sure you, your special ed staff, um, are talking to PSLs and to us about those cases. Um, I also noticed there were lots of good questions among uh, you all posting, so or questions and suggestions like Kevin uh, and some others. So we will certainly be reviewing all of that. So um, if there are uh, a few questions before we um, close out today, go ahead. Let's see. I see Jean has a question. Jean Consuelo Mapuvo. Hi, team. Thank you so much for this. Um, it's really been um, eye-opening. I do remember hearing at the beginning of this that one thing um, we wanted to make sure was that teachers were documenting the instruction that they were providing for students. And my question is, is that still the case? Um, and is there uh, some way that that needs to happen or format? Um, you know, is that noted in CSTARS just to show that teachers were making an effort to um, be on contact in terms of instructing children and what they were doing? Thank you. That's a great question. We've not dictated a format, but what we have said every chance we get is please document, right? So we told leads and department chairs last week, your teachers can create um, a model that they like. One, you know, I would keep it a document per student and then upload what you have into CSTARS to document. And this doesn't mean all raw data needs to be uploaded, but summaries of, you know, I worked on this goal on this day with this student. Um, flexibility and doing what works for teachers. I, I saw some concern that we're expecting a lot for teachers. Um, that's why we haven't dictated the amount of time for every TLP. Um, okay, so let me grab a couple more questions. Um, there was somebody before Lisa, but I missed it. But So Lisa Pilsen. Hi, guys. Thank you. This real quick. Um, <clears throat> We had been given and given guidance regarding the distribution of technology for our students in grades three through six. How do we handle situations where we have students that have ATS um, tools that are on school computers, but they are in second or first grade? Are we able to distribute technology to those children, although they were not in that permissible group? My understanding is that there are not um, pieces of equipment available for younger than third grade, but I'm but we will double check that answer and get you that information. Oh, Mary Beth, go ahead. Mary Beth? Oh, we can't hear you. Hmm. Okay, uh, Mary Beth, we'll, we'll get you or uh, put it in the chat. Sorry, I don't know if anybody else can hear you. I can't hear you. Um, all right, Mary Duffy. Hi, everybody. Thanks for doing this session today. Um, question about the, the special ed services and the, the teachers meeting with um, students. Are they um, to be meeting with students to work on goals individually? Um, can they have their own session where they're meeting in small groups? Can that service also be done during like the, the time with the gen ed teacher if they put them in like smaller groups or something like that? I'm just trying to understand um, what kind of contact the teacher needs to be making with, with students, if that makes sense. Sure. So um, I'll let Mike jump in, but um, actually I have forgotten your question because I'm reading the chat. Sorry, Mike, did you catch that question? Sure. So I will, I will say that right now we're working with division council around a confidentiality notice as well as some of the informed consent forms for some of our related service providers. We do have concerns regarding small groups of students 
and teachers, especially if it's a small group of special education students uh, and parents at home uh, having access, of course, to those lessons and the things that are taking place within those small group lessons. And so we've got some language that we're working with Division Council that we might be able to provide uh, very soon to schools. Um, we have concerns. We've heard from some other divisions that some parents have been recording sessions within small groups and posting on social media. So we have a lot of concerns around confidentiality of student information and disclosing of student information. So we're hoping to get within a couple of days some guidance. But I would say individual meetings with parents that, yes, related service providers can provide synchronous individual meetings with parents, and they can work on, on goals or, or supports that students might be needing. They can, of course, push into the larger general ed setting, and they can join their general ed counterparts. And again, without disclosing who the special education students are, they can be looking and observing and then following up individually with students. Um, but we're going to get back to you on the small group piece because we do have those concerns around confidentiality. Okay, so for now, teachers, um, we, like at least for the first week, should be directing them to be meeting with students individually or um, like online or via phone. And then they could be joining um, the whole group, the whole class lesson, but they are not to be indicating which students are special ed. Yes, okay. that's correct. Yep. Yeah, so we've got um, just a couple minutes before our secondary colleagues um, session starts. So we'll end the elementary here. We will continue to uh, put out answers and please contact any one of us for an answer that you didn't get today. Thank you so much. Thank you.